Alrighty, good morning everyone. Welcome back to the Patent Literacy Symposium. My name is Dawn Durham. I'm an educational consultant out of the Patent Harrisburg office and I'll be facilitating this session for you. Reading Rockets videos demonstrating foundational skills instruction. We're excited to have Linda Farrell with us today. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. This session will be 75 minutes and is being recorded. Closed captioning is available if you need it. Um, please keep your camera and microphone off. This will just eliminate any distractions so we can really focus on the content and the learning for today. We will be offered some opportunities to ask questions and make comments. Uh, Linda Farrow will allow us some, kind of some stopping points throughout her time today. Go ahead and put your questions and comments in the chat box and I'll make sure that I archive and maintain those for you. We would love for you to share out on social media what you're learning, what you're inspired about, what's gotten you really pumped up over the last couple of days and all through the rest of today. Please use the hashtag PA Lit Symposium 2020. I'm excited to introduce to you today, Linda Farrell. Volunteering to teach adult struggling readers was a natural for Linda, who is a former English teacher, school counselor, and lifelong bookworm. Linda met her mentor, Dr. Louisa Motes, while she was volunteering to teach adults to read. She has since co-authored the Teaching Reading Essentials Program Guide and Coach's Guide with Dr. Motes. Linda is also co-author with Michael Hunter of Phonics Blitz, First Edition, Phonics Boost, and the Diagnostic Decoding Surveys. Linda was a national letters trainer with Dr. Motes for seven years. She has been presenting workshops, giving speeches, offering publications, and developing reading assessment and instructional material for more than 10 years. To keep her skills fresh and innovative, Linda works with struggling readers of all ages whenever she has a chance to do so. Linda, we're excited to have you today and the floor is all yours. Thank you. I'm, I'm listening to the bio and I can tell it's an old one because it's now been 20 years instead of 10 years. <laughs> so that's a very old bio uh, that I must have sent to you, my mistake. Um, we are going today to just give you an overview of some videos that are on, the, that are free, that you can use for free, that are on Reading Rockets that you might be able to use for uh, a number of reasons, a couple of reasons, which we will talk about as we get into it. Um, you can see up here, it's Reading Rockets by WIDA. That's our public television station here in Washington, DC. And they produced these, these videos. Um, how that happened is that the man, Noel Gunther, who's in charge of Reading Rockets and a number of other things at WIDA, I actually tutored his son. And he kept saying, we need to get you on video. We need to get you on video. And so finally they did. And it's called Looking at Reading Interventions. You can find it on uh, the Reading Rockets website. So we've got some objectives. And for time, I'm not going to read these. You can read them yourself. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to view one entire video of a lesson that's up on the website. And then I'm just going to give you snippets of the other five lessons that are up there so that you know what kind of resource you have available. If we have time, which will depend on the number of questions, then we might see some videos of extra clips. Uh, for that, you'll get to see me log on to uh, Reading Rockets and figure out how to find the videos. So, um, we are going to go and and we've already talked about this so we'll talk about the background about the videos how we got these videos is that noel called and asked could we find a school so we found us that would that would let us tape students we found a very generous school that is about 20 30 miles outside washington dc in maryland they identified 25 struggling readers in grades k to three we from Readsters went up and we assessed those 25 students. Noel and Christian were there from Reading Rockets to watch us assess so that they could pick the best students who would be students who would be good on camera. And um, what I did and Michael and Nicole did is we looked at the assessments and then we wrote up a little profile of the 
of each of the students what what they had um, what their strengths were what their weaknesses were and then reading rockets picked six of them uh, it was just my luck that of the six that we had gone to great extent to plan lessons for based on the based on the assessments one of them wasn't at school that day so one of the of the videos the lessons is totally free form i didn't know anything about the student and we just started playing and taped the student and i'll show you which one that is when we get to it so all six videos and half of the interviews were shot in one day only and the reason i i think this is important for you to know is that these are real lessons. These are not stage lessons. These are not scripted lessons. These are not um, even, they were planned because we knew what the assessment was, but I had never worked with any of these students before. So they were real lessons, <laughs> real first lessons. Um, also, it was very funny. When I was there, we got there and I said, well, what do I do when I want to stop because I did something wrong and I'd like to retape and Noel and Christian said no retaping. We're just going to shoot you. We'll shoot 20, 20 to 30 minutes for each student and then we'll edit the videos. Well, you can imagine that a first lesson with students is not the perfect lesson and editing was phenomenal. They, uh, they did a great job. So we're going to start out by watching an entire video with Iko. She's in grade two and she has problems with BD confusion. This is what I knew when I went in, um, keeping her eyes on the letters and words. And then she had problems reading short vowel words without sounding out the words. So we're gonna see these addressed. Let's get started on the video. Okay, we're going to have a lesson and we are going to have some fun. Today, reading expert Linda Farrell will be working with Iko, a second grader here at Windy Hill Elementary <laughs> in Calvert County, Maryland. Ms. Farrell will help Iko with telling the difference between the letters B and D, keeping her eyes on the text rather than looking up to think of words, and reading words with short vowels. Do you ever get your B's and D's mixed up? Sometimes? Well, let's see if we can't fix that. Okay. Iko confuses B's and D's. She's in the second grade, and it's going to get in the way of her reading. So we have to fix that problem, and lots of children confuse B's and D's. They look like, you know, it's a ball and a stick. So we know we have to straighten that out, because that's going to hurt your reading, because there are lots of words with B's and D's. We're going to work on fixing that. So we're going to learn about our B hand. Have you ever used your B hand? They have a B hand. Their B hand, it looks like a B. Here's the circle. Here's the line. And we teach them to not guess and to slow down and compare your hand to the letter. This is your B hand. Okay, so I'm going to put this little rubber band on you so you can remember which one's your B hand. So which one's your B hand? This one. this one. Okay. I don't tell a kindergartner, a first grader, or a second grader it's your left hand because they don't know which one's their left hand. Sometimes I don't even know which one's my left hand. Uh, when we first teach it, we put something on their hand. We might put a sticker. I put a rubber band on Iko's hand so that when I say, where's your B hand? She's got something that reminds her. Three, three lessons, she won't need the rubber band anymore. She'll know what it is. Some kids get it right away. Would you put your B hand up like this and make a fist? And then put your finger up, okay? And that is your B hand. And I'm gonna show you why it's your B hand. Go like this. I'm gonna put this down here, and this letter is a B. And your hand looks like this letter. Can you see that? We have the circle right here. Where's the circle on the letter? Point to the circle on the letter. And where's the circle on your hand? Yeah, right there. Where's the stick on the letter? Show me the stick on your finger. This is your B hand because the stick is on the same side of the circle as your finger. So your finger and your st and the stick are on the same side of the circle. Lots of kids get B's and D's mixed up. First kindergarten, first and second grade. Does not mean 
that they have dyslexia. Students who have dyslexia have phonological processing issues. They do not differentiate sounds easily. They, they, there are, their problems are primarily related to phonological awareness. BD is about shapes. That is not about sounds. Will you put your B hand by the B? Yep. And is your finger on the same side of the circle as the stick or on a different side of the circle? Look the at me. The same side. The same side. Yeah. Let's go down here. Is this a B or a D? B. Okay. And when you answer, I want you to look down here and compare it. Here's what you did. You went, well, you're not going to figure it out unless you look and you compare. Okay, so you have to look and say, oh, I can tell. So is that a B or a D? Ms. Farrell's explicit lesson about recognizing the shape of the letter B will take some time to sink in for Iko. And there's a common habit she'll need to deal with. When Aiko is working on identifying a letter, she often looks up to think, looking away from the letter. The answer to what is an incorrect letter or an incorrect word is in the print. And we have to teach Aiko to keep her eyes on the print, on the words when she's reading or the letters. Worked with many kids that have the same difficulty. And I'll say, keep your eyes on the words and they can't do it because their habit is so strong that they can't try to do what I'm asking them to do and remember to keep their eyes up, down. So we just practice keeping your eyes down. We're gonna practice looking down here, okay? So I'm gonna ask you a question and you can't look up until I go like this, okay? So you keep looking down, don't look up. Look down, look down, look down, look down. Now you can look up. Okay, let's try it again. Look down, look down, look down, look down. Eventually, okay. Aiko will now, need to have images Aiko. of words stored in her brain. Now, this is critical to the immediate word recognition necessary for fluent reading. When right students there. say a word without I'm looking at it, they miss opportunities to I develop those button. images. So hold your hand up here. Okay, so I'm going to go A, because I don't need my B hand. But do I need my B hand for that letter? Eh. Yes, I do, because that's a B or a D. So I have to put my B hand and. Let me see, is that a B or a D? Which one do you think? Oh, where are you gonna look? Down. Yes, okay, is that a B or a D? B. Let's try that, put your B hand next to that. Okay, is your finger on the same or a different side? Different. Different, so is that a B or a D? D. Yes, and we're gonna keep looking down. Remember, you don't get to look up until I stomp, okay? So now I want you we're going to go just right to here, okay? So watch me. A, D, S, B. You do it. Okay, put your hand up here for the A. Okay, do a, it. A, D, S, B. Okay, now, see how far away your hand is? you got to go like this. And you know where you looked when you read? You looked at me, but where are you supposed to be looking? Here. Yep, at the letter. So, okay, so we did those four. You do these four, and right this here. is isolated practice. I see lots of teachers who use a B and D hand or a B hand, but they only do it when the kid misses a word. So, oh, you read bog is dog. Use your B hand. You don't have to use your B hand. If it's not bog, it's dog. We've got to have isolated practice to rewire the brain, to stop guessing, and start looking. And that's what we did with Iko. Iko has pretty significant BD issues. With this kind of practice, she could solve her BD issues, I believe, in three or four weeks if we did this every day. B. You got it. Do you think you can do 10 in a row? I think you can. Let's try it. Okay. X. B. D, A, hand down. Is your hand, is your finger on the same side or a different side? Different, so, so it's a D. Yes, okay. O,
B C D J 10 out of 10 that's too After good. a little more practice with B and D okay. Miss Farrell will help Iko work on another skill read. reading short vowel words without sounding them out aloud first and Iko will need to lean on her new skills distinguishing between B and D using her B hand and concentrating on looking down at the words while she thinks can you just read these words right here? Not. Ran. Tap. Man. On. Could you read these words right here, please? Bib. Ad. Could you check and see if that's a B or a D? With, use your B hand. Is that a B or a D? D. It is a D. So what's he did okay add L what's the word pal look down always keep your eyes on the words go kit hump okay you got five words right. Can you touch and say that word? Hug. It is hug. Read them all again. Did add pal gum it hug. Okay, now you got six out of six right. When you read this word, you went k it. Did you hear yourself do that? Okay. It's okay. I want you to do that in your head. So what we're going to do is we're going to close our mouth until we're ready to read the word. It goes like this. Did. Add. I have to think those sounds in my head. So can you do that? Let's read these. Cut. Dig. Pup. Mouth closed. Lip. Kit. Locked. Okay. Now, two things. You got five right. Can you? What's that word? Kit. It is kit. And the other thing is you looked up. So we're going to practice looking down. Okay. You're going to look down. Look down here until I stomp. Okay. You can look up. Okay. Let's do it again. Okay, now you're going to read, and you can't look up until I stomp, okay? So remember, you're not going to look up till I stomp. So I'll hold this, okay? So start reading. Cut. Big. Pup. Lip. Kip. Lock. That was perfect. You kept your eyes down the whole time. Can you check and see if that's a B or a D? Use your hand. Use D your B hand. Use your B hand. D yeah. So what's the word? Dig. It is. We're going to go over here. And again, don't look up until I stop. So read those. Hot. You can use your B hand right there. In one short lesson, Iko has made a lot of progress. She's learning to keep her head down as she reads, focusing on the letters. She's using her B hand to help her identify her B's and D's more accurately. And she's reading words as a whole rather than sound by sound. As she practices and works toward mastery of these skills, her reading will get better and better. Mud. You kept your eyes down and you got them all right. Six out of six? Yes. We'd like to thank the wonderful students and families at Windy Hill for sharing these experiences. So you met Iko, grade two, and um, you saw about, you probably saw about seven minutes of me working with her and about five minutes of me talking about her. So what we worked on with Iko was 
fixing BD confusions, getting ICO to look at the letters and words when reading, and I think that was a huge issue, you saw that, and then reading the whole word instead of sound by sound. I hope what you saw is that when she was reading and I gave her two instructions, look at the letters when you're reading and close your mouth, two was too many. So we just were gonna work on look at the letters and then she, eventually she would be in the habit of looking at the letters. Then we would work on whole word instead of sound by sound. And as soon as she got that, then we would work on her fixing her BD confusions without me having to remind her. So this was not a, would not be a fast process with ICO, but every single one of those problems you could see could be addressed. She just needed some practice. She needed lots of practice for each of them. So we have some simple takeaways from this. Students need to look at the letters and words in order to develop a mental orthographic image. That's the new buzz term from researchers, MOI. And all that means is that students store letters or strings of letters and the attached sounds or words, the whole word, in their brain along with the sounds and they, for instant retrieval. So that's where we're trying to get Iko at CVC words before we ever give her anything that's harder, even the, though she's in the second grade, our reading lessons are going to focus exact or our intervention lessons are going to focus on the specific problem she has. She's going to, we're going to work on short vowels. That's it. Um, fixing BD. I hope you see that fixing BD takes focused practice outside of reading text. That's how we're going to change her neural pathways so that when she sees a B, she knows that's a B. What we will do is we will first practice with the anchor of her B hand. Then once she's good with the anchor, what we will, once she's mastered B's and D's with the anchor, we take the anchor away. Then she has to read B's and D's without her anchor. And then we give her words like bud and bid and did and dud that could be different words if she switched B, B or D and she has to read all of those. And what that's doing is giving her focused practice on BD and straightening out those letters, making sure she doesn't um, mix them up. Always reread for 100% accuracy. When I watch this video, I am reminded of um, that when you're being taped and you're working with a student for the first time and you are um, trying to manage all these materials in a, in a room that isn't yours, sometimes you forget to do what you you're supposed to. I often, most of the time, I remembered to have, it's my habit, I had, uh, when Aiko made a mistake, she went back and she didn't just read the word that she had missed. She read the word she'd missed. Then she went back and read all six words again. That builds stamina with accuracy. That's what we're trying to get is Aiko to read accurately. There was one time when she missed a BD. Can't remember which one it was. I didn't have her go back and reread all five, and I should have, but I was probably thinking, oh, I have to get on and get something else in the short amount of time it take. So that was a mistake. Um, also, you teach students to read whole words by having them first look at the word, think the sounds in their head before they read it aloud. And the way to get them to do that is have them close their mouths while they are thinking the sounds. Otherwise, they'll subvocalize. They'll keep um, saying the three sounds aloud. And if you want to know more about that, I'm going to, the next session is with Kalista, and we work specifically on the sound by sound problem. Um, and we talk a lot about what causes that problem. So that is ICO. And I'm wondering if there are any questions in the chat box. So there were lots of great comments about that BD strategy. People are really liking that. And something that was interesting was a couple of people pointed out, you didn't have, I go do a B and a D hand, just a B hand. 
Well, if it's not a B, it's a D. They don't get B and X mixed up. They don't get B and C mixed up. They get they do get B and P, B and P occasionally mixed up, but that goes away once you fix B B D. Um, is the question why don't I have a B hand? I think it was just surprising because several folks were saying, oh, I'm always doing, you know, the B and the D, and then there's, which one do they choose? So it's really just focusing on one of them. If it's not that one, it's the other. So that was a lot of the comments, just, oh, I should, maybe I should be eliminating the using both hands to, to straighten that out. Well, that's what, we used to use BD, then we realized BD didn't work. I mean, we used to use a BD, B and a D hand. We realized that didn't work. So we went to a, a just a B hand. And then first we practiced, our practice was just B or D. And it didn't fix the problem. So we, we really thought about it. Okay, we've got the B hand. We know they're not getting mixed up. Which hand should they have to use? It's just one hand. It also helps when they're writing. Um, it's one hand, but th when they were just, when we had 10, 10 letters of BD, it just wasn't working. So what we thought is, well, that's because there's a 50% chance they're still guessing. So that's when we put five other letters on the line. And that is when we started getting pretty fast results. Now, Iko would not be fast. She has a huge problem. She also has other issues that you have to address, which are looking at the page. But we find that lots of kids, this can work, say, two weeks practice, um, sometimes even one week practice. So anything else? Yeah, the, another question I got about that BD confusion is at what age do we anticipate we, the students do not have that problem? Or at what age should we say, uh oh, this is a big red flag for us in some way, shape or form? How long would we expect that confusion to occur? Well, it's real interesting because I get asked that question and there are researchers who will tell you, ah, if they have BD problems in the first grade, don't worry, don't worry. That's not a big deal. That, that actually, I believe, harkens back to developmental theory and that, oh, they're just not ready to learn BD. Um, I think the question is, when should you start fixing it? <laughs> More than when should you expect it to go away on its own? Um, because it often doesn't. Clearly it didn't go away for Iko, she's in the, the second grade. So what we do is we recommend that teachers in kindergarten, when they introduce the letter B to their students, that they greet them at the door and say, hi, today we're gonna do, talk about your B hand. And they either get a B sticker or a rubber band or something and they just stick it right on every kid's hand. And then when the kindergarten teacher teaches the B, she just, is, she, it's not like it's mixed up. Look at this, you're, the B looks like you, this, your hand. So, and then they just put, oh yeah, that's what the B looks like, which side is on. And then when they introduce D, they do the same thing with the B hand. They say, look at this, compare this. I had a, this from a kindergarten teacher. I didn't make this up. I'm struggling readers. I don't work with whole classrooms unless everybody's struggling usually. I mean, occasionally I do. But a kindergarten teacher told me, you know what, you taught me it eliminated all the BD problems in my kindergarten. And I said, I didn't teach you anything to eliminate the BD problems because I fix the BD problems. <laughs> and she said, oh no. And she told me just what I told you. And she said, no BD problems. First, this was on an uh, Indian reservation. She said it's the first year that she's never had BD problems. So, to me, you fix it the minute you observe it. And just with the practice. So I didn't questions. really answer the question, but- well, we have um, two more. One of them, that spiral bound book with the word list, is that available at Reading Rockets or is that just something you had handy? Um, that's actually, I'm not here to sell anything. You could use lots of different things, but because you've asked, that's something that we at Readsters sell. That's. Okay. That's the only program we have, and it's for, uh, you know, just for beginning readers is what we use it for. Okay, and I think you've been answered this by sticking with the B question, but I want to put it out there because a friend had asked, if a student is writes with their left hand, because we do want to transition into reading and writing, would you suggest that student do a D hand? Would that be easier? If, if I were working one-on-one -on -one, real easily, if I'm, if I'm doing the kindergarten part, it's just a B hand. It's too hard to differentiate. You three kids do a D, it's just a B hand. And then if, if it, 
if you're teaching handwriting correctly, it you they will not have BD problems. But um, so because handwriting is a different issue. Okay, that's it. Thank you. That's all. So that's I can keep perfect. going. Okay. Um, just to let you know, there's a similar format for all the lesson videos. They're different time. That was a 12 minute, you're about 12. If you, we'd gone through the credits, it would have been 13 minutes. But um, each one is a different time, but they all have an introduction that explains the purpose of the lesson. They have a mixture of me working with the student and me talking about the lesson. And then they have voiceover explaining parts of the lesson. So that's in every one of the lessons. We don't have time to watch every one of the lessons, but what we are going to do is watch um, a bit of the six different clips. Before we do that, let's talk about possible uses for the videos. When Reading Rockets put these together, they thought they would be good for educators. So for professional development or for educators to go and use. But interestingly, as it turns out, we get lots of parents who look at these to get ideas for helping their students. Not, and we get lots of educators. And how do I know we get parents? Because they write me. Parents who have struggling readers are desperate. And they will always write and they will say, Linda, I know you're too busy to take my email and it won't offend me if you don't answer, but um, I just don't know what to do with my student and I want to be able to do this. And there, in fact, the last one I got was from the UK, from Oxford, which is a wonderful little town. And um, so it turns out that these are good for parents to use personally, as well as for professional, as well as for official professional development, but also just for teachers to watch on their own. Um, when, if you use this for professional development and if you, or even if you watch these for your own professional development, I hope you will think that there are, remember that there are three critical parts to effective teaching. And two of these are demonstrated in the video and one is not. And I think the one that's not is probably the most important one, but it is skilled teaching, which is number three, skilled teaching to make sure that the critical prerequisite skills are in place. And that's number two, put the problem in broader context. Putting the problem in broader, broader context means that you understand that Iko's in second grade. These are the skills she's supposed to have. She's supposed to be working on vowel teams, multisyllable words, prefixes and suffixes, but she's not ready in intervention to work with those. So in the broader context, she's missing critical kindergarten and first grade reading skills. So that's what we have to work on. We, we have to work on what she's missing, not what she's supposed to be learning. And then finally, what's not in the video, but which was the only reason that I told Noel, sure, I can sit down and work with anybody if I have a, an assessment, if I have the right kind of assessment. So for every one of these students, I went in with an idea of what their issue was so that I could start a lesson. And then I might have to adjust in the lesson, but uh, I, did, I didn't assess Iko, so, and someone had written she can't, she doesn't keep her eyes on the page. So I, I was a little bit prepared for that, but the truth is Iko has the most severe eyes not on the page that I've ever worked with. And of course it's videoed. Um, so I had to adjust the, what I thought I would do a little bit as I was teaching based on that. So um, that's, that's what's in every video. So now we'll view five, we'll view parts of the five remaining lessons. Just for your information, if you go to the interventions website, the Reading Rockets intervention website, you'll see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six lessons of me with children. And then there's another, when they were filming me with the third grader who was reading multi-syllable words, what happened is we had a little, when he came in or at the end, I said, oh, just read to me. And it wasn't a part of the lesson. I was just doing it because he's a kid and they were changing the film or something. And they, they weren't changing the film because they taped it, but they were talking about something. And they took that 
because I worked a little bit, even though I wasn't working with him on fluency, I did work a little bit with him on fluency or accuracy during that clip. So there's that clip. And then, excuse me, there are a whole bunch of extra video clips that we will get to at the end if we have time. Um, I didn't know how much time we'd have because of the, the questions, but we'll try to get to some of those. So there are just some extra clips. So that's what you've got. First, we're gonna look at Reese. He's in kindergarten. When we assessed, we found that he had uppercase letter confusions and lowercase letter confusions. Because V and Y showed up in both of those, I was prepared to teach V and Y. What I wasn't prepared for was how um, strong his learning previously had been that both of those were Y. So you'll see that a little bit when we watch the lesson. These were problems that were assessed, but we didn't address in the video. He had some letter sounds wrong. He had some high frequency words that he didn't know. And this is at the end of kindergarten when we're assessing. So, but we chose, since we only had a half an hour, that we would work on his letter name confusions. He had very strong phonemic awareness. And he also is a very good talker, as you'll see. So um, let's look at Reese and watch him. When I first started working with Reese, I thought that he could not remember the name of V. So I have, I get a stack of index cards. Maybe I get 12, maybe I get 14, maybe I get eight. Half of those will be the letter that we're working on, one letter. The other half will be letters that he is very confident with. So he doesn't have to think about those. So that I go, what's the name of this letter? What's the name of this letter? As I did that, it was real easy for him to say V, V, V. Let's do V. V. What's the name of that letter? V. What's at the bottom of the V? Point. You got it. Say V. V. Okay, what's that letter? S. V. E. V. C. V. T. V. X. Let's try these one more time. You think you can go through them again? There's a lot of V. <laughs> Once Ms. Farrell saw that Reese knew the name of the letter V, then she worked on helping Reese discriminate between the letters V and Y. My job is to figure out a way to make them not confusing. For him, they all looked like they were the same shape. So I have to think, okay, as I was working with him, I saw that he confused V and Y. He'd already told me Oh, they both have these and they look, this has a point here and a point here. So my job is to get him to look at the letter and give him a way to verbalize the difference between the shapes of the letters. And I had never done this before with, with V and Y, but I looked and I said, well, V has a point at the bottom. And why doesn't have a point at the bottom? This goes through my mind. Why doesn't have a point at the bottom? What's at the bottom is a line. Okay, so I'll make that difference. This is a V. And Y. You got it. Now, there's a line at the bottom of Y. What's at the bottom of Y? Line. A line. What's at the bottom of V? Point. Okay, say V has a point. V has a point. V. V. Say Y has a line. Y has a line. Y. Y. Okay, now point to the point and say V has a point. V. V has a point. V. Say Y has a line. Y, y. has a line. Line. Say Y, y. has a line. Y. Just case, y do has it again. a line. Y. Got to point to the line. Y has a line. Y. V has a point. V. Okay, now we're gonna, every time I show you a letter, you have to say that, and then you have to say it, okay? okay. You ready? Okay, here we go. V has a point V. V has a point V. V has a point V. Y has a line Y. 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 Okay, now, I want you to try saying them without saying V has a 
point B. Just say the name of the letter. Go slow. Okay? Okay. I might go quicker and quicker. Why? Okay, now you have to look down and point and tell me why. What does Y have? A line. A line. What does V? v. <laughs> it is. I started in this lesson by just getting him to know V. But that wasn't going to work because he still wanted to call it a Y sometimes. So I needed to set up the contrast. And you saw that it worked as long as he said V has a point, Y has a line. V has a point, V. Y has a line, Y. I stopped the scaffolding too quickly. So we have some takeaways from Reese. And the simple takeaways are that students have to look at the letters when saying the letter um, or sound. And that wasn't really in the short clip, but you all may have noticed that he did try to look up and I did work on him looking at the letters. Um, be sure that students can sing the alphabet song. You also didn't see that part of the clip. But in the clip, Reese can't sing, of course, L-M-N-O-P, nor, and he mixes up W, which is one of the letters he ends up having trouble with. So that's also beyond what you saw in the clip, but it is in there. Work on one new letter at a time until you see a contrast. I mean, you see a contrast have the students use verbal and tactile cues to differentiate the letters. <coughs> Excuse me, of course it's allergy season here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that is Reese. Any questions about Reese? We did have a question. You know, you talked initially about some assessments to kind of determine where the struggles were. And we had someone who was asking, well, what was the initial assessment or assessments that were used? The assessment that we gave Reese was uh, called the pre-reading probes. And they are free on our website. I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say you can go and get them free. I'm not trying to sell anything. They're called the pre-reading probes. And they tell us what, what skills that students should have mastered before they start learning to read that they haven't mastered. And clearly before a student can read uh, well, doesn't mean that if he knows M-A-S-T, he can't read Matt. But um, what he does, Reese was very far behind. And one of the problems was he just, he just wasn't quick or accurate at naming his letters. And that's part of what's in the pre-reading probes. And the other one is you talked about, you know, having verbal and tactile clues to really hone in on the differences between these letters. Um, and one of the questions was, well, what kind of tactile clues would you use um, raised letter cards? Would you do something with Sam? Oh, tactile, the tactile was he had to touch the V. Okay. He had to touch the, the, he had to touch the point on the V and match that with the verbal. So V has a point V. He can't just say V has a point V. He has to touch V, the point on V. He can't just say Y has a line. He has to touch the line on Y. That's the tactile part. Okay, and that was all the questions for now. Thanks, Linda. So good, okay. So now we'll go to Autumn. <laughs> These kids are so cute. They just make me smile when I remember them. Autumn is the one that I didn't, I, we had assessed, but I didn't have a lesson plan for her and we didn't even have her assessment. So I had to play with her. She's just as cute as she can be. And her problem ended up being blending onset rhyme, which is a huge problem for struggling readers. If you work much with struggling readers, you'll understand that on the phonological side, the kids, it's easy to teach blending and segmenting syllables and even manipulating syllables, but boy, you get to onset rhyme and it just, whoo, it is hard to teach. So um, we also found some other problems with Autumn that she can't accurately recite the alphabet. She skipped P and she stopped at S. She didn't know her uppercase letters E, D, M was N, V was C. Um, her lowercase letters, she, so she, can you see that she has a lot of pre-reading skills gaps? Um, if I had had time, I might have worked on more than one thing, but 
really all I was prepared for was um, to work a little bit on set rhyme because you don't need any props for that. So um, anyhow, so that's what you'll see. When we assessed Autumn with the pre-reading probe, she had no obvious strength. You can see that she had um, weaknesses on the orthographic side, which is about letters, and on the phonological side. So let's watch Autumn. We just did syllables. We're going to do something called onset rhyme right now. Watch this. This is un. What's this? What's this? Un. What it happens if I put it together? Sun. Let's try this one. Mmm. Mmm. Ache. Ache. What is it when I put it together? Ache. Ache is this part. Watch me. What's this part? Mm. Mm. Ache. So this is ache. Can you say ache? Mm. Mm. Ache. You point to each one. Mm. Ache. Oh. Ache. If this part's ache. This part is ache. Watch this. Mm, ache. For a lot of children, blending onset and rhyme is much harder than blending syllables. And that makes sense, says Miss Farrell. Syllables are very easy to hear. You can even feel syllables. They have acoustic clues for you. Computer. They break cleanly. When I go and I do sh ert, I don't really say sh ert. I say shirt. It's one acoustic clue. Some people's brains just don't get that automatically. Let's do this one. Are you ready? Okay. This is rat. You do it. Rat. Rat. You got that one so fast. Tell me the parts again. Rat. Rat. Oh my gosh. Should we try another one? Okay. Shop. Strawberry. <laughs> Strawberry starts with an S and shop starts with an S. Let's try this again. Strawberry. <laughs> um, Autumn is a guesser. And you can see that Autumn is a guesser. You can also see that Autumn looks up. Remember, she had a whole bunch of weaknesses. One, if I could have gone back and taped this again, I would have been working on her looking down at the manipulatives, which were felts in this case, at the manipulatives as she worked on them because that's just got to teach her to look at what you're working with, but I didn't. So let's look at simple, and remember, you're only seeing a little tiny part of this clip. So the simple takeaways are students may look like they're getting it. Remember, she did sun easily, but mastery is required before leaving the skill. So one word does not make mastery. Um, also, onset rhyme is much more difficult to blend than syllables. She, I work with her a little bit in this video on syllables and she gets those very easily. Okay, you may have noticed that when I recognized that Un, sun, was very hard. I went to a different strategy. I went to what we call blending through vowel and then the end. Rat becomes rat. That's actually easier to do than onset rhyme because you're getting most of the word before you get the end. And you're getting a continuant that just goes right into the the uh, final sound. And if anybody has questions about that, you can ask more about that. Um, and then students need to, to, to break the habit of guessing. Autumn was a guesser. I mean, she's just, she's just so cute and she, and she is cute and she just guesses and we can't let her guess. Um, we need to develop the habit of thinking before she gives an answer. So any questions about Autumn?
Just one came through, Linda. They, this participant noticed that you were using felt squares and it appeared as though there was a slight um, size difference between the onset and the rind, but not a lot of color difference. And this person was asking, does the color matter? Does the size matter? Is that something they should be thinking about when they add manipulatives? In, in my opinion, and this is not research-based or anything, it's just me, the color doesn't matter. It, in fact, sometimes color is confusing, but, but it really doesn't matter. What we try to do is we try to use different manipulatives for different phonological awareness tasks. For example, when we're doing syllables, we use two index size felt squares or larger felt squares so that those are big parts of words. And when the kids see that we put out only uh, large squares, I'm sorry, those would be rectangles, only large rectangles, they know that's a syllable. They just start associating, oh, this is a syllable task. For onset rhyme, we use one small one and then a larger one. We just use the syllable one so that it's, it's a symbol of one part is smaller and one part is the larger part of the word. When we get to phonemes, we use the smaller felt squares. Actually, we use cubes for felt, for, um, for felt, for phonemes, but, or you'll see what we use if, if you come to the next one. I can't remember if we use those at all in, in these little clips. Um, but so my, my answer is, I don't care if they're different color or not different color. The truth is, I don't even care if they're different shape. It's a nuance. I can teach this with salt packets, with candy, whatever happens to be around when I recognize that a kid needs that help. It's just that the, I think the most important thing is that you have a manipulative and then all the rest is nuance. I think, I think that's a good clarification, so I appreciate that. That's all for right now. Okay. So now we'll go to Kalista, and Kalista is in first grade. We've been meeting kindergartners, now we meet a first grader. And um, Kalista, oh, she's just so cute, I wanted to take her home. And um, Kalista reads sound by sound, so that she looks at a word and she goes, look at that. And um, she's accurate in her reading most of the time, and but she has to read sound by sound. and. I don't care if she's accurate. She's still at a, at a very beginning level of reading if she's reading sound by sound. And we have to get her over that hump from reading sound by sound to reading words. So her strength was that she reads accurately and her weakness is that she reads sound by sound. So um, let's watch. Kalista is in first grade at Windy Hill Elementary School in Calvert County, Maryland. She's an early stage reader who sounds out letters accurately, and she can blend those letters together to form words. Kalista, could you please read this column? D, id, did, ad, ad, al, pal, g, um, gum. Reading expert Linda Farrell is helping Kalista take the next step toward fluent reading, reading each word as a whole rather than one sound at a time. Kalista was very confident with her vowel sounds. She, she knew them. I would still have worked on them a little bit more, but she was confident enough for me to move on to the next step. So the next step with a kid who's reading sound by sound isn't really intuitive. It's often a phonological problem. It isn't a problem with the letters. The kid knows the letters. I know the letter sounds. I can blend the letter sounds into a real word. What they aren't doing is thinking the sounds in their mind. They're turning that word if it's hug. They look at it and they go hug, and they are never getting the full visual picture of that word. To them, it's always an H-U-G, and hug, not hug. So they haven't moved to the, where they can read the whole word without breaking it into phonics. And that's a step that we're gonna have to teach her to do, which is one of my favorite things to do because it's just, they just go from being really slow readers to just being normal readers once they can get this phonological representation. We're going to do something that we call sound chaining. 
Okay, I'm gonna show you how it works. So I say, Miss Linda, show me the sounds in lip. So I go, O, I, P, lip. You touch and say. O, I, P, lip. Okay, what's the first sound in lip? L. L is the name of the letter. What's the sound? Ooh. What's the next sound in lip? I. I is the name of the letter. What's the sound? I. Okay, and when I ask you, you point to it, okay? So what's the first sound in lip? Ooh. What's the next sound in lip? I. And the last sound in lip? P. And what's the lip? Word? Okay, so that's lip. If I want to change lip, to sip, I take out the O and I put in a S. Touch and say sip. 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 What if I want to change sip to tip? You take away this one and add. Okay, so one. what did I take out? Sip mm -hmm. to tip. Say sip to tip. Sip to tip. Which one did I take out? If this is sip, take out the S and add. Okay, now I want to change tip to Tim. Hmm. So let's touch and say tip. T -i -p tip. Now touch and say Tim. T -i Tim. Which one's different? The last one. So what do I take out of tip to change tip one. to Tim? And what sound do I take out? P is the name of the letter. What's the sound? Okay, take it out. And what do I put in to make it Tim? M. M is the name of the letter. What's the sound? M. Mm. Okay. So that's just part of Kalista. There, were, she probably has the. Well, she and Iko probably have the most different things I worked with packed into one. So that's the next session. Um, so let's look and see what the takeaways are from the ICO video, not just the part you saw, but the whole thing. Persistent sound by sound readers almost always have difficulty manipulating phonemes. And that is, um, that was not intuitive to me, but we figured it out about 15 years ago when I worked with a little girl named Darby in uh, Wyoming. And um, David Kilpatrick's work and David Shear's work are all about how important manipulating phonemes is. Uh, when, you, when we get to the reading part of this lesson where Kalista reads, what we have her do is we have her close her mouth and think the sounds just like we did for I, it was Iko, just like we did for Iko, Kalista had a much more severe sound by sound problem than Iko did. So, um, if this coaching students to think the sounds and keep their mouth closed works well if they can manipulate sounds, manipulate phonemes. So, um, that's what came out of this clip. Any questions? Oh, sorry there. Just one quick one um, about sound chaining. Do you ever move sound chaining to where you do engage with print? Or do you just always keep it at the phony level? Well, when we're doing phonemic awareness, it's always without letters because we don't want the distraction of the letters. Later on, uh, I didn't, I didn't put it in this clip, but we have we, she, Kalista gets pretty good at figuring out what sound changes. So then I ask her to change tap to tape, and she says e, <laughs> because she's thinking of the letter. Do you see how that becomes a distraction from what are the sounds? So um, no, when we, do, when we teach reading, we start teaching reading, then we do word chains, but they're more limited than sound chains. A word change only works with the vowel patterns and the consonant patterns that we've used. For example, we could change cat to bat, to bet, to bit, to bid, but we can't change um, cat to Kate because they don't know how to read that until so um, they don't know how to read Kate so they don't know what letters to put in there. So sound chaining can use all the sounds but letter chaining is 
is has a different purpose than sound chaining. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. I think that's it for right now. Okay, so we'll move to the next one. So this is Michael. Now we're at grade three and Michael has a problem with silent E. We call it the hop hope problem. The kid looks at the word hope and he says, oh, I know that word. The E jumps over the vowel and it makes the O long. The word is hop. He knows the rule. He just doesn't read the word correctly. So um, that's what we're going to work on with Michael. He had really good strength. He's the first child we've seen that looks at the words you're reading. You'll notice Kalista, she wanted to look at me for the right answer. And we've just got to get kids to get their eyes on the print. And, and that happens often, just even getting their eyes on the manipulatives when they're doing uh, phonological awareness. So let's watch Michael. Uh, just a clip, not the whole thing. So we're gonna learn something called two finger touch and say. So when you touch with one finger, you're gonna say, ah, that's the short A sound. So touch with one finger. Are you, if you were write your name, would you, yeah. So touch with this finger, okay? Okay, uh. so, okay. when we touch like this, we're gonna say A. When it's an A and an E together, go A. Can you do that? A. Okay, so go. A, uh, A. Now watch me touch and say this word. M, A, D, man. You do it. M, A, D. Med. So I used one finger to touch that A. Now watch this. When I have this, I have an A and an E, so I'm going to use two fingers. So watch me. M A D made. You do it. M A D made. Okay, and you go like this. M A D made. You do it. M A D made. Okay, so you know about two finger touch and say. Ms. Farrell thinks this multisensory technique will help Michael internalize his ability to recognize the silent E letter pattern. It takes a while to learn this approach, but it will be worth it. Now, we're gonna just practice right here. So, I want you to practice saying A, 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 okay? A, 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 A. Let's do this one again, okay? Ah, uh, a, 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 a,
Chad, Glade, same, Sam, Payne. So that is Michael, and he made tremendous progress from guessing at what we call the hop hope words and actually paying attention to the pattern, understanding that the pattern tells him what vowel sound to use, and then being able to incorporate that into reading the words. That's a whole bunch of stuff to go on. So let's look at the simple takeaways. Make sure each student can read CVC words accurately before teaching silent E. If they are not automatic, have not reached automaticity with CVC words, their intervention should be on CVC words. He was accurate with CVC words. He was inaccurate with silent E. So that's where we started his intervention. We would not have started there just because he's a third grader and he needs to need learn silent E. We would have only started there because he has, he, we would only start there if he knows CVC words. The next one is use two finger touch and say to teach silent E words. Drop the rules. Don't even care. I don't even care if he knows it's short and long A. It's A when it's this pattern and it's A when it's this pattern. And then practice reading CVC and silent words. Do you notice that we didn't have him just read silent E? He had to read CVC and then silent E with a scaffold and then he reads it without a scaffold and it's accuracy before rate. He's clearly not very fast. I'm gonna work on accuracy before working on speeding him up. Any questions? There are no questions, but people are showing appreciation for um, having another strategy in their toolbox. Oh, good, glad to hear that. Okay, so finally we have Xavier and given time, this is probably about as far as we'll get, but uh, Xavier is in third grade and he's a kind of more of a typical third grade uh, struggling reader um, Michael was pretty, that was pretty, he had some pretty basic skills that were missing, but Xavier, he's just got multi-syllable. So that's what we addressed. So let's watch Xavier. Reading expert Linda Farrell is working with Xavier, a third grader at Windy Hill Elementary in Calvert County, Maryland. She'll be helping him learn how to read multi-syllable words. Okay, now I'm gonna teach you about reading two syllable words. This is kind of fun. Here's what I know. Every syllable has a vowel in it. So in order to figure out how many syllables there are, I have to count the vowels. So can you tell me how many vowel letters do you see in that word? Two. Yep. Are they together or apart? Apart. They are apart. If I have two vowels, letters, and they're apart, I'm going to have two syllables. So I'm going to draw two lines right here. And I have to have a vowel letter in every syllable. So can you break that word into two syllables for me? Yeah. Now this is a nonsense word, so we're going to read it. What's the first syllable? Jod. Pum. What's the word? Jod pom. So read it again. Jod pom. And the word is? Jod pom. That's a nonsense word. I just made it up. I literally just made that word up right now. I've never even seen that word before. But we now know what to do if we have a word that we don't know. So let's try another word. Volcano. Oh, you got the first two syllables. You got the first syllable right. How many vowels do you see? Three. Together apart. Apart. Okay. Okay, read each syllable. Vowel, can. Hmm, what's that middle syllable? Can, ick. Touch each syllable and read it. Vol, can, ick. 
Uh huh. X. Wait, wait, what's that? Ick. Yeah, let's do it again. Volcanic. Volcanic. How many vowels did you see? Three. Okay, could you underline them, please? Give me four. Let's try this one. How many vowels do you see? O, A, I, E. Okay, so how many? You can underline them if you want. Why don't you start here and go this way, yeah. Okay, so how many? Four. Together, apart. Apart. Okay. Do you want to try to read it without breaking it into syllables? Try Accomplish it. Accomplishment. What was the word? Accomplishment. It's accomplishment. You are right. As Xavier grasps the strategy, you can see him thinking through the two questions. How many vowels? Are the vowels together or apart? And he's able to read big words without writing out the syllables. Maryland third grader Xavier is sharing one of his favorite books with reading expert Linda Farrell. Miss Farrell is going to help him focus on reading every word accurately. Can you read some of this to me? Can you read? Look. We're he heroes because we're, we save the world from Flippy. This it says here that scientists are going to study Flippy brain. Get the S on that. Studies. D. What's this word right here? This one right here. Flippies. Yeah, read that whole thing again. It says here that scientists are going to study Flippy's brain. Okay, so that was Xavier. The second part you saw with him reading the book was where they were just filming me, even though I wasn't teaching him, but I am. it's impossible for me not to teach. So, of course, as he was reading to me, I had to teach. Anyhow, the simple takeaways for Xavier is that Start teaching multi-syllables using only words, using words that only have short vowels or schwa. Have students look at the vowels in the word as a guide to break the words into syllables. Notice I don't ask, is this a CVCCCVVVCCVVVC word? I don't ask, is this an open syllable or a closed syllable? I want the student to work on visually breaking the word into sounds around the vowels. If I taught short vowels, well, he'll be able to do this with short vowel words. If I, once I teach silent E, he could do it with silent E words. Once I teach R control, he can do it with those. But he can start reading third grade. He's got to start reading really sophisticated words. So that's why I use those with him. Um, Students have to read every individual syllable accurately before blending syllables into a word. And you saw what they do when they don't do that. They quickly, they guess. Volcanic is volcano. Every kid will do that if they have trouble with multisyllable words. And finally, we did spelling in this. You'll get a kick if you watch this about him spelling. So any questions? We just had one quick question. I think I answered it, but I'll, I'll give you your, get your thoughts on this real briefly here. Um, all the different terms for silent E, silent E, magic E, vowel consonant E, would you stick with one to be consistent or would you throw all of them out there? <laughs> uh, did you notice that I didn't ever mention that at all? <laughs> I didn't use any of those. I just went, here's the pattern. But if I were in a school, I would hope that the school would settle on one Whatever you want, I don't care what it is. I use silent E because that's what I grew up. I, well, I didn't really have phonics, so I didn't grow up with that, but that's what I've heard is silent E a lot. Um, whatever you use, but you guys, it's not about recognizing this is a silent E pattern. It's recognizing that when you see that pattern, you say the long vowel. That's, 
that's what's got to be in there. And you don't even have to stay long or short. It's just they've got to recognize the pattern. So I think we have about two minutes left. We got through what I wanted to look at. There are more videos. There are extra clips that are listed. Um, I was, if we had time, I was going to show one, but we don't have time. I think the video on the simple view of reading is really good. It's 11 minutes long. You guys, if you want to do some professional development with it, it might help you with your professional develop. And that's thank you. And are there any questions? I haven't seen, I've, I've been monitoring as folks have been going in and we've been kind of pushing them out to you throughout the session. So I'm thinking there's not, but I just want to say, Linda, thank you so much for sharing your insights with all of us. We're so appreciative of you. Thank you to all of you who attended our session. We're so thankful. This session again was recorded and will be uploaded onto Patton's YouTube channel in the near future. 